talk about chasing low-cost energy, I'd like you guys to please welcome to the stage Mr. Philip Walton. He's a co-founder of Gridless. Thank you. So uh, I thought it was really important. Um, I've had a few conversations uh, over the last uh, couple of days where, you know, I go off on my passionate rant about why energy going into Bitcoin is so important. Um, and people are like, yeah, I don't like to talk about that. Uh, you know, that's not my favorite part of selling somebody on Bitcoin. Um, and so I thought it was uh, a good idea to put an advisory warning on here that uh, I'm going to be talking about proof of work and why it's good. Um, and talking about uh, the use of ever more increasing amounts of energy and why that's good. So I'm going to tell you a story about a guy that lived uh, in this part of the world in the 14th century. Uh, his name was Mansa Musa. Eh, there he is. I don't think that's a Bitcoin. I think that's gold. Uh, but it could be a Bitcoin. We don't know. And uh, in the 14th century, Mansa Musa built a massive empire across uh, this part of West Africa. Um, and as part of that, he assimilated a number of different kingdoms. Um, and in assimilating those kingdoms, he amassed an incredible amount of gold. Um, it's estimated uh, that he had upwards of $400 billion uh, in gold, which would make him the richest man in all of human history. So with, the, with the, this massive wealth of gold, he decided to go on his Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. And so he started traveling. And as he traveled, everywhere he went, he left gold behind. So the city of Timbuktu uh, was actually founded. It wasn't a city before he came through. But he left gold, kept tracking. When he got to Cairo, he destroyed the Egyptian economy for almost 10 years because he left so much gold behind. And so when they asked him, Mr. Musa, wh where did you get all this gold? And his answer was, in my kingdom, it grows like wildflower. The truth is that at the time, this part of the world had an abundance of gold. It was easy to access. You didn't have uh, lots of effort required. You could, you know, almost just reach down and pick it up. Um, and so he was able to collect a massive amount of gold. Um, in our Bitcoin context, this is like mining during the first epoch. This guy was getting 50 Bitcoin mining rewards. Um, but, you know, when you fast forward 600 years to today, getting gold's not that easy. You know, in, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, it took 10 tons of gold, or 10 tons of, uh, gold ore to produce one ounce. At the end of the century, it took 20 tons. And what that means is it took an ever-increasing amount of energy to produce a unit of gold. So just a small fun fact, uh, the gold star on there is my hometown, Ouagadougou. Uh, so I grew up between where we're at today and then that first town that got orange-pilled 600 years ago, Timbuktu. So when we come back to today and we talk about another hard currency that is increasingly exposing the frailty of the modern fiat economy, we know, all know the attributes that make this so valuable. Hard money, permissionless, distributed, transparent. But the foundation of every single one of these attributes is the dependence upon energy-intensive, proof-of-work validation model. I'm going to say that again. The energy-intensive proof-of-work validation model is what allows us to have all of these other attributes that we are so excited to talk about and we know that are revolutionizing the economic world. The fact that every new Bitcoin requires the embodiment of a valuable resource, which is energy, means that with each block that we miners uh, are, in, are producing, is increasing the overall intrinsic value of the network. So if energy is the scarce input, so if energy is the raw material for the production of Bitcoin, how much energy does it take to create a single Bitcoin? Well, as of today, it is 330,000 kilowatt hours of energy that's required to produce one Bitcoin. 
Now, I understand that there are some people that don't believe in the core attributes of Bitcoin, probably because it threatens their power base. And so they want to say that Bitcoin is a waster of energy. But I want everyone in this room, every Bitcoiner should be confident to promote the fact that Bitcoin and its consumption of energy, the digitization of energy, is what in fact makes Bitcoin the deflationary hard asset that we all know and love. So how much is 330,000 kilowatt hours? Just to put it into a little bit of context, that's uh, four minutes of powering Legos, not very long. Uh, today, that's 4.3 kilos of gold. So that's how much energy it takes to produce 4.3 kilos of gold. 3,800 recharges of a Tesla, 37,500 liters of petrol, and 66,700 Africans energy for a day. Now, what's interesting about that is 6,600,000 6, Africans is one-tenth of 1% 1 of the Africans that currently do not have electricity today. Bitcoin is going to be a key part of making that happen. So if, <clears throat> Sorry. if energy is the raw material that makes Bitcoin, uh, then it stands to reason that the cheaper the raw material, the more money we can make. I mean, it's basic unit economics. Um, and so you can see from this chart that the cost of industrial power uh, in different parts of the world uh, makes it too expensive to mine Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know if you can quite see the colors, but there's a, there's a green shaded area. When the red line is above that green shaded area, you can't make money mining, mining Bitcoin. Um, and so this is why we see places like the US right now, where they do have cheaper industrial electricity, we're seeing a lot of uh, mining activities going on. Um, but you could look at this and say, okay, if the input is expensive, then why wouldn't the price go up? I mean, we see that with other commodities, and sometimes it does. But when the price of Bitcoin goes up, then more miners turn on their mining, and as more miners turn on their mining, it gets harder to find a block, and as it gets harder to find a block, you need more energy, and then you end up uh, dealing with what we call the difficulty adjustment. And so that's effectively what makes Bitcoin the chaser of the cheapest form of energy possible. So my good friend Eric Hersman here says that uh, Bitcoin and energy is like pouring water on an une uneven floor. It's always going to pull up in the lowest point. So why do the promoters of Bitcoin Energy FUD, why are they so wrong? They want to believe that Bitcoin is an ever hungrier beast, taking electricity biscuits out of the mouths of starving children. Bitcoin is in fact the motivation for chasing cheaper and cheaper energy wherever it can be found. And just like Mansa Musa said, in Africa, we have abundant energy resources that grow like wildflowers. So if we step back from how much national grids charge for energy and we start looking at how much it costs to produce various forms of energy, then it makes it a lot more sense to understand how chasing cheap energy in Africa today is the equivalent of stacking sats during bear markets. So let me digress for a moment. I, I do want to explain what LCOE is. I know it's a term that a people, Bitcoiners probably don't normally think about. Uh, in the energy space, LCOE is the levelized cost of energy. And what that means is if you take all the costs of constructing an energy site, operating an energy site, financing an energy site, and you divide it by the total number of energy units that can be produced, you get an LCOE. Uh, and that becomes a starting point for understanding our unit economics in Bitcoin. So the first thing to consider is that with a few notable exceptions, on the African continent, we're predominantly building renewable resources. Um, the next thing to understand is that the cost of equipment, if you're buying solar panels or hydro turbines um, or biogas plants, pretty much costs the same everywhere. But the difference is in Africa, we don't have the regulatory uh, and infrastructure burdens that you have in other countries. And so therefore, 
the administrative cost, the civil works um, of building energy is much cheaper, leading us to have a much cheaper LCOE. So this is a Western um, LCOE model. Hydro is at six cents. In Africa, we can, we can have an LCOE of less than three cents because of those differences in cost. And more importantly, we're not building renewable because we want a green badge or we have some ESG objective. We're building renewable because it's the cheapest form of energy. So now that we understand the cost side, uh, what is the revenue side of the equation? So thanks to the fine folks at Luxor Mining Pool, they've given us uh, an incredible historical account of the hash price uh, over the last five years or so. And what is the hash price? So the hash price is how much money do you earn for a unit of computing effort? So in, in the Bitcoin mining world, we talk about terahashes or petahashes. So if I have uh, 100 machines and they're each making one terahash, I'm sorry, uh, 10 terahash, I have one petahash, 1,000 terahashes. If the hash price is eight cents per terahash, then I'm gonna make $80 a day with that. Now, that doesn't tell me, that tells me how much I get paid for my unit of computing, but it doesn't tell me how much I get paid for my unit of energy. And so in order to understand that, we have to look at the efficiency of the machines. Um, and so over time, that blue line shows that the machines get more and more efficient. So if I have, let's say, an M30S, a what's minor M30S, um, I'll actually earn about nine cents a kilowatt hour today. Um, and if I have an M50S, which is a much more efficient machine, I'll earn closer to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So using uh, a variety of, of inputs, I was able to take that hash rate data and to show over the last five years how much money does Bitcoin pay per kilowatt hour. Um, and what you'll notice is the fat part of this graph up towards the top is a range of seven to 11 cents. What that means is even during the worst bear markets, Bitcoin is still paying seven to 11 cents a kilowatt hour. That's the revenue side of our equation. Now, during the bull markets, the stuff towards the bottom of the page does get a bit more frothy. So what that means is that we do in fact have a valid economic justification for building new energy in Africa with Bitcoin being the buyer of first resort. In other words, we build energy where the first anchor customer is Bitcoin. But how does that impact the communities that we live in? So if Bitcoin is this global buyer of money, so Bitcoin is cash on the barrel head. If you run the machine, you get paid. And Bitcoin is pricing for energy across the world. Imagine now that I can go to a, a rural community and I can say that Bitcoin is buying electricity at nine cents a kilowatt hour. Well, then I can sell to Sarah at 10 cents a kilowatt hour and still make money. And incidentally, at that point, Sarah is going to have some of the cheapest energy in the world. Be 63%, so 63% uh, percent of what somebody in the US would pay, 38% of what somebody in Germany would pay. How it works today is when energy developers come in and they build a new energy site and they expect Sarah to foot the entire bill for that site, she's often paying up to a dollar a kilowatt hour. So we can dramatically change the economics not only for ourselves, but also for the communities that we're building energy in. All right, so the last slide was actually just a map of Africa showing all of the renewable uh, energy resources. Um, and I think what's important to understand is that if we view Bitcoin as the driver for new energy development, new renewable energy development in Africa, um, we can, there we go, um, we, we can have an economic model where we make more revenue than our cost, where we can deliver a higher quality product at, at a lower overall cost to the consumer, and we can start to develop a future of energy development in Africa where Bitcoin is the foundation 
and African Bitcoin miners are the ones that are gonna take advantage of this abundant energy resource that grows like wildflowers. Thank you. Thank you.